Welcome to an extra bonus episode of Church Historia. As we recorded season one, our conversations took us in many directions, and not all of them made sense as part of an episode. Today, we're excited to bring you one of those extra conversations, recorded in the context of our episode about the Marthoma Church and our conversations with Jesse and Renu. In this case, our extra conversational meandering was about food, culture, faith, and finding sacredness in the ordinary. One of the things that I really loved about talking to Renu and Jissy, and I was articulating this to a friend a couple days after, was that there is so much of the Christian tradition that is affected by our culture that we have already built up outside of church, outside of faith. And I loved when Renu and Jissy talked about there, there was a lot of food, the, the aunties, that they said the aunties were around. And this friend that I was talking to about this said, well, that's the beauty of Christianity is that missionaries can go to a tribe in Africa and the gospel says that you it, it meets your culture where you are and transforms it. It doesn't ask you to suddenly reform and become, you know, start changing the way that you dress. Start, you know, all these things necessarily. Um, a tribe in Africa can adopt the gospel without having to completely uproot their culture. It, it comes alongside culture and transforms it. And I think that that is evidence of God as creator. God not only created, but creates and and breathes into life and sustains life. And I think we can sometimes forget that God is in the ordinary things, and we only think that God is in church or in, in things that are it stamped church approved or somehow have like the flag of Jesus, um, you know, staked mm. out of like doing mm-hmm. this for God. And so now God, now God is here. Mm. God, God is always mm. here. So I, I do understand the sort of countercultural elements of Christianity because I think just to say cr- culture and Christianity are one and the same can itself be dangerous, but it's also equally as dangerous to assume that God is nowhere to be found in whatever mm. combination of cultures that you're in. We've talked about this before, that you're not just part of a culture. Yeah, you are right. part of a multitude of cultures that intersect in your life. And I think it's a mistake to assume that God is somehow not present in the ones that are, quote unquote, secular, or that God is not present unless you've somehow baptized the hmm. thing that you're doing for Christ. Um, I think you know, talking about the aunties making food, making food can be this beautiful gift of of life and community and communion. And I think it can be that way even if we don't necessarily say, I am doing this thing for you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it, it still carries with it that godness of God's stamp is, is everywhere and is in the ordinary. Yeah. And it's important to remember that. And I think, like you said, I, I really enjoyed hearing from Renu and Jissy about that intersection for them between this experience of this Christian tradition and their culture. And I also think that as a white person, I forget that I also experience that same thing. My Christianity mm. is very informed by my Americanness, by my whiteness. Mm-hmm. That That is a culture that shapes it it just happens to be the dominant one within the community that I live, so it can be easy to forget yeah. that that I have this that I have this culture that my culture and my Christianity are also in dialogue and in shaping. And I think mm-hmm. it can be be a helpful reminder. Yes, that or at least it was a, it's a helpful reminder to me that came out of that conversation with Rainy and Jesse to remember that that is that same interplay between culture and Christianity with all of the blessings that that brings and then also the muddiness that that brings about, am I doing this because it's a cultural thing? Am I doing this because it's a Christian thing? Can I even tell the two apart anymore? Mm. That's all part of the fact that Christianity is a lived experience in the world. Our our humanity is is messy. Uh, There are so many things I want to say. Let me start with this. Um, A good friend of mine passed away in a 
ATV accident a couple weeks ago. And I've been thinking a lot about her life and our, our relationship. And we both come from a very similar place. Uh, she was raised, she was raised Presbyterian and I was raised like Baptist, but there are just all sorts of things that both are, that we related to. She grew up really wanting to live on a ton of land with a ton of dogs, wanted to be a veterinarian at some point, loved creation, loved animals, all these things. And I feel fortunate that I was able to move to Nashville and meet these different cultures of Christians that loved creation, loved taking care of creation. It was important. It's it's important to take care of our yard and the things that were given and steward it well. And I, I have often in the months since I've gotten to know this friend a little bit better, and, and then in the couple weeks since her death, thought, I'm just so sad that she didn't get to encounter a Christian culture that uh, that upheld those things that are are so Christian in nature. Mm-hmm. You know, and so she kind of took a path away from Christianity because there wasn't a, a culture of Christianity that she related to that made sense. We need to see what is culture that we are making up and what is the Christian faith I think um, it's very easy in the South where we feel like everybody's a Christian and everybody gets the kind of culture, the Christian sort of Southern culture. And it's just not true. Um, There are practices, there are things that we're interested in that we can explain as a part of our culture that is then heightened and brightened by the gospel. Um, So that's the one thing I want to say. Second thing, um, I'm going to bring this book up, but... Every moment holy. I only, there we go. I didn't. Okay. I, I was thinking about dropping the pitch. Okay, but let me. You, thank you for letting me do it. It You're always welcome. delights me. You're welcome. Was talking to a cousin recently who gifted this book to a friend of hers, and this friend of hers didn't necessarily have a, a strong faith that she knew of. She was just moving into a new house, so my cousin gifted her this book that has a liturgy in it for moving into a new home, and. The friend has texted my cousin several times to just tell her she's using the book all the time. She's reading from it. She loves it. And I think the important is not necessarily, that's not to um, put the book on this pedestal, but I think what it does and what you're speaking to here and where you're saying that God is in the everyday moments is that if we believe and if we act as though God is only with us when we are in a beautiful sanctuary singing songs together then it that's like two hours out of our week so this book every moment holy has liturgies for things like keeping of bees domestic days changing diapers those moments are holy god is in those moments god is present god is there and i think that is real and and one of the things that i appreciate about that book is they are things that are a regular part of the rhythm of life that the changing of diapers, the drinking of morning coffee, the planting of a garden, these are these are things that are part of the regular day of life because we can also incorporate God out, you know, outside of church into daily living. But I think there are a couple of ways of doing that. And one of that is to sort of always try to hold yourself slightly apart from from that ordinary, from that everyday, as if there was something wrong with the ordinary. Mm. And Mm. the fact of the incarnation is that God embodied the ordinary. I'm sure Jesus had runny noses Mm -hmm. and scraped up his knees and did these everyday things that we did. And that was God incarnate was willing to do those everyday things. And so I'm sure he got food poisoning. Probably at it's least. It's hard once. to think about Jesus throwing up, but he must have. But he probably did. And yeah. you know, maybe was had bouts of colic as a baby. Mm. I don't I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the gospels don't, don't give us that that level of detail. <laughs> right? But we do know that Jesus was fully human. And so you can only imagine that Jesus did these ordinary things that he didn't hold himself apart from living from the world, he didn't feel the need to kind of create this buffer between himself and the world, but instead stepped into the world, became incarnate in the world, took on that fullness of humanity. And in doing that, I think calls out and to, or calls to light, highlights 
the godness that is already there, the fact that God is already in those spaces, that it's not just church on Sunday mornings. It's not just the things that we do that keep us distant from the world. It is also the things of the world that when God created the world, God said are good. And that, yes, there's the fall. Yes, there's sin. But I I don't think that obliterated all of the goodness mm. that God saw mm. at creation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we that that goodness is still there. And I think things like celebrating the food at prayer meeting and celebrating and having moments of reflection for caring for children and for the earth and for pets and all of these things give us glimpses of that goodness, which are ultimately glimpses of the creator. Mm-hmm. And I think even even if you're not a Christian, I think there is tremendous value in taking time to see these sacred moments in in the ordinary and to be open to that beauty and that sacred presence that can Mm. be found there. Mm. Thanks for joining us for this bonus episode of Church Historia. To get notified about bonus content and announcements about Season 2, join our email list at churchhistoria.com. Follow us on Instagram at churchhistoria and follow Church Historia on your favorite podcast platform. Church Historia is me, Stephanie Fulbright, and Leslie Eiler Thompson, our producer and editor. Our podcast music was written and played by Andrea Yowie.